Bark really focuses on our work on protecting and restoring the public lands around Mount Hood National Forest. Mount Hood National Forest, like all national forests, is public land. It's kind of the ground zero here. That means it's your land, that means it's my land, that means it's all the critters and the plants and the fish who live there, it's their land. Another really cool thing about Mount Hood National Forest and one of the reasons that it's so special, it's an urban forest and it provides drinking water to millions of people around Mount Hood. There's 13 different municipal watersheds that come off of Mount Hood National Forest and that's very important for us in Portland because ours is one of them. The Bull Run is up there. Happily, it's protected after a lot of fighting. There's also the Clackamas River watershed, which is a drinking watershed for Estacada, West Lynn, Lake Oswego, Oregon City. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is stuff going on and stuff that was going to happen in the Clackamas River watershed, which is also a drinking watershed and yet unprotected. So this is our public land. This is our drinking water. And this is also our public land. And this is where our drinking water comes from. Both are true in the Mount Hood National Forest. It's a place of great beauty. It's a place of great devastation. Over 4,000 miles of logging roads crisscross Mount Hood National Forest. There have been over 2,600 clear cuts on Mount Hood National Forest. The extent and amount of the degradation that's happened to the forest on Mount Hood is kind of unimaginable. It's nothing that could have barely ever happened in cataclysmic events, even Mount St. Helens didn't have the impact on its forests that logging and industrial roading has had on Mount Hood. So that's what we've got to work with. The amazing thing about the forest, though, is even in a land of old growth stumps, it's growing back. In its own quiet way, the forest is surviving, and it's restoring itself. But its recovery is not without a fight. So we're going to talk tonight about a couple of threats, both past and present, to the Mount Hood National Forest and people who fought to protect it and the fights that we're still doing to move on. So one thing that I'm really excited about to talk about is that this year marks the 10th anniversary of saving the Eagle Timber Sales that were in the Clackamas River Ranger District on Mount Hood. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Eagle Sales and celebrate that history and then look at how the current threats compare to Eagle and what's going on and why thinning and restoration via logging is not as benign as the forest would service would suggest. The Eagle Timber Sales were proposed in 1996 under an insidious piece of legislation that was tacked onto an appropriations bill called the Salvage Rider, which is great. It said any forest that has been damaged by logging or bugs or could be damaged by logging or bugs is exempted from all rules, all environmental rules, basically, and is not subject to judicial review. Now, can you imagine a forest that might not be subject to fire or bugs? I mean, is there such a forest that might not burn down? It's not, which means it was open season for logging in Cascadia. And the Eagle Sale came from that, and one of the reasons that people were so upset was because there was no judicial review. There was no legal recourse to stop the sale. So all sorts of fun things happened. In just a, a little bit more about Eagle, is it, it was in the Eagle Creek watershed, which is part of the Clackamas River watershed. And like I said before, that's a drinking water supply for many people all through Clackamas County. It was about 1,000 acres, logging about 110 to 130 year old trees. It was naturally regenerated second growth trees. And then there were some legacy trees and remnant patches of old growth scattered throughout. And in early 1997, people began fighting the Eagle timber sale. And almost six years later, six years later, in 2002, we forced the Forest Service to withdraw the sale after it had only logged about a third of the sale. So we consider that a victory. And like I said, this year marks the 10th anniversary of that victory. And that really changed the shape of logging on Mount Hood. It didn't get rid of it altogether, but they haven't proposed logging like Eagle since it was canceled. I want to spend just a little time telling a brief story of how we did it. I could talk for a very long time, as could other people in this room. But um, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to think about as we look at the current threats and whether and how the strategies we're using will be effective in stopping them. I'll also say this is a personal story. Eagle was where I got my start as a forest activist in 1997. And the work I did there, the lessons I learned, the people I met have completely shaped the way that I've been as a forest activist. Now, in the room, I see a lot of other people who have a similar story. 
Raise your hand if you help. Stop, Eagle. Oh, higher. Come on. Mark, get your hands up. <laughs> so there are a number of us who were active there. And if you look at the Bark board and staff, most of the staff and about half of the board got its start as Cascadia Forest Alliance, which was an Earth First group, focused on stopping Eagle by whatever means necessary, which meant a lot of fun. It's a little fuzzy, but that's me in, in the center of that picture. I didn't know until I, oh, these, these were slides that I just made digital, so if the, you know, if they look kind of funky, that's because we were using cameras with slides back then. We had a slideshow, not a PowerPoint. So that, I'll just say for historical reference, is the pod on the upper road of Eagle. That was an action camp sometime in there. I don't really remember much except that fellow standing next to me was his 80th birthday and he was at the action camp and we thought that was really cool. How do we stop the Eagle sale? One thing that Eagle had going for it was that it had this remnant old growth that was beautiful. This tree was part of the Sunset Grove. I'm not sure if it was Sunset. There were tree sits in a number of, of different trees and the tree sits really grounded the campaign. There were people living in trees for about four years. And no matter what was happening out on the roads, no matter what was getting logged, we knew that there were people always there, really focusing and holding down the trees. This was one of Bark's first executive directors, Sandy Schreinberg, in the tree set. Just give a, a feel of what life was like living in those trees. So we did tree sits, action camps, roadblocks, public education, hikes, marches, rallies, political lobbying for years and years. It kept happening. It was pretty much an all-volunteer effort, um, which was impressive. And it really gained momentum, but logging was still happening. And um, this is Ivan Molesky looking sad. He works for the Sierra Club now. And um, this was some of the logging. This is a shelter wood cut, I call it. You know, those, those trees are left to become seed trees for future forests. And uh, this was some of the logging that we weren't able to prevent. So we upped the ante. I just found this. It was so fun to read. Oh, y'all can't really read it. It's a chronology of illegal activities. This was put out by the Forest Service in 2002, shortly before the sales were canceled. And it lists, oh, they missed some, but it lists a lot of the activities that happened. So you might be able to see, starting in June of 1998, there started to be lockdowns on gates. And then in April 99, the tree sits went up in the grove. It's kind of fun throughout this. You might not see it. It's like, oh, the tree sits are still there. Oh, and the tree sits are still there. All the way down to June 21st, 2000. Tree sits are still there, you know. So the tree sits really held it down. And then there were different pods and blockades. But I bring this up now because in May in 2000, the protesters basically blocked both roads, completely blocked access to the sale. And I wish I had a picture of the pods um, because no longer was there access. They had gotten in and logged a third of the sale and people said, that's enough, we're just shutting it down. And that kept up for about three, three and a half months until the Forest Service sent in, you know, a hundred guys in RoboCop gear and night vision and it was traumatic and everything got taken down. And then they put an exclusion on the land. And an interesting thing to note is they never logged again after that. But they did kick everybody out of the sale. And so there was only one thing to do, and that was take it to town. This is what we called the trace it. <laughs> right after the raid of Eagle, when everyone got kicked out of the forest, Treyero decided to shimmy up the federal building. That's the Forest Service and BLM headquarters on 2nd and Oak in downtown Portland and live on that ledge for 11 days. And if the tree sits and all the other protests, you know, they kind of started getting the media, but having a crazy guy on a 11 inch ledge in downtown Portland, I mean, people were all over it. And the momentum that we'd been building through years and years and years of organizing really took off and just showed how when the public imagination is sparked in a really accessible way, things can move. So that helped things move. It crystallized focus and attention, and it moved Ron Wyden, who had been pushing for a long time to actually have a backbone, which is something he's not well known for, and pushing to have Eagle canceled. He did it, you know, after even more public pressure. There were 
this was the biggest rally ever. Thousands of people marched from Pioneer Square. And so a bunch of scientists, including Jerry Franklin, who's one of the most well-known Pacific Northwest scientists, went out to Eagle and independently determined that the Forest Service had not um, looked at blowdown well enough. And they recommended that 2.8 million board feet of the sale be dropped. Now, of course, the sale was much more than that. That was only 10% of the sale. But it was enough to give Wyden the political clout he needed to push in Congress for the sale to be canceled. And in April of 2002, after years of fighting, the rest of the sale got protected. So, yay! So it was amazing. And um, things have changed in the Forest Service since then. You know, we really did something, but 10 years later, I think it's a very important thing for people to ask, what was that something? How did things change? Are they better? We know they're different. We know the Forest Service isn't doing, you know, timber sales where the average age of trees is 120 years anymore. We know they're not targeting legacy old growth anymore. But what are they doing? And what was the effect of the Eagle Timber Sale? So this was the fun part. This was the, woohoo, we won. That's great. We're all celebrating in August with a reunion in the woods, which will also be fun. And I'd love to keep up a happy glow and just tell stories for the rest of the evening about how fun it was to stop the Eagle Timber Sales. But I have to tell you all about Jazz, which is the Forest Service's latest and biggest plan in the Clackamas River watershed. We go to the Kalawash. The Kalawash River is also a tributary to the Clackamas River watershed. It's beautiful. It's rare in that it has the last run, the, the last run of Lake Coho salmon is in the Kalawash watershed. That's something. The Kalawash watershed is also unique because it's the most geologically unstable part of all of Mount Hood National Forest. This is from the watershed analysis. And if you look at the scale, this is the mass wasting risk. The Kalawash has something really cool called earth flows. And I didn't really know much about earth flows until I started working with the Kalawash. They're like large glaciers of soil. They move very slowly, except when they get really saturated, and then they move really fast, and they're landslides. So if you look at the scale, it doesn't go from like low to high. It goes from moderate to high to very high. That's the scale on which earth flows show up in the Kalawash. So you see the mass wasting or landslide risk throughout the entire watershed is really high. It means the ground is moving. You can see it when you're there by the trees that have big bows in them as they're con continually trying to adjust to the land. You can see it, as I'll show in pictures later, with the roads that don't know how to adjust, and so sometimes do very dramatic things. So this is the watershed. The Kalawash has also been heavily logged. At least half of the watershed has been logged. And there's about five miles of road per square mile throughout the watershed. So that's the baseline that we have. There's one thing that the Forest Service and BARC completely agree on. The Kalawash watershed needs restoration. Again, it's a really important tributary to the Clackamas. It's been highly degraded. It needs to be restored. So the question is, what does that restoration look like? Here's a little bit about what the forest looked like. This is you know, 144 of Jess. It's been recovering for about the past 50 years from being a clear cut. It's currently in the stage that's called natural stem exclusion, where the trees are getting old enough that some trees will naturally die and become snags or coarse woody debris, which the ecosystem is sorely lacking in. Things that were clear cut don't have snags. And the more I understand forests, the more I understand that dead trees are actually one of the most important things that you can have there. Standing dead trees provide habitat for innumerable critters in the forest. The plantations that were all logged don't have many snags. They don't have much coarse woody debris on the ground. The forests are finally reaching a time where trees will start to die and provide that habitat. And they'll fall some of them, they'll stand some of them. The forest will slowly recover itself if it was left to do so. But the Forest Service has other plans. So they think that, ja that the forest needs active recovery. The recovery of this forest means logging 2,000 acres 
82 units spread over 30 miles is recovery. They're calling it recovery via commercial thin. Recovery via logging or commercial thinning projects for restoration are premised on the idea that they need to grow bigger trees faster. And currently, like I said, these trees are reaching the stem exclusion phase and the trees are being choked. They're overstocked. The trees are not allowed to grow big enough, fast enough. So to promote that, they have to take about half of the trees away and let the remaining trees grow bigger faster. That's the Forest Service's entire premise to this. They call this a restoration project. They are releasing the vigor. They are getting rid of the suppressed mortality. Those were the first two parts of the purpose and use for the jazz sale. The uh, second part is, or the third part was to provide a sustainable supply of timber to local counties. So no, that's the third after restoring the forest in its entirety. So the arguments for this restoration via logging kind of presume that the forest thins itself by magic, that the trees are dense and overstocked and then they're thin and vigorous. And they skip the part in the middle. The part of what does it mean to do an industrial commercial logging sale on a scale like jazz. So even if growing trees bigger faster was a de really desirable outcome, we get stuck on the question of whether or not the impacts of industrial logging are worth that increased growth. And note, of course, that the increased growth comes with the loss of snags or the loss of coarse woody debris or all of the biomass that would have died naturally and contributed back to the forest. But it's important to think about the infrastructural pieces because that's the part that people aren't talking about. Even many of our allies in the environmental movement who talk about commercial thinning of plantations as a win-win solution never actually talk about how that tree gets from the forest to the mill. Now, with that in mind, let's compare Eagle and Jazz. Now remember, thousands of people fought for six years to stop Eagle. And right now, pretty much bark on its own is fighting jazz because it's been very difficult to get traction around commercial thins. They're both in the Clackamas River watershed. Jazz is about 1,000 acres bigger. Eagle had 868 acres of commercial thin. The rest was that shelter wood cut like the picture I showed you. Jazz is commercial thin, but for the 111 acres of clear cuts that will be created through roads and yarding corridors, the Eagle Timber Sale had no logging in late successional reserve or riparian reserves. None. You can see that Jazz has logging in three, 734 acres of riparian reserves and 726 acres of late successional reserves. You might think, why could, how could you log in a late successional reserve or riparian reserve? You can log in them if the purpose of logging is restoration. So the volume, how many come out? 28 million board feet from Eagle, 64 million board feet, almost three times as much from Jazz. Average tree age, 110 to 130. Average tree age in Jazz is 50 to 70. I'd be upset too. <laughs> yarding acres, now pay attention to the yarding because we're gonna talk a lot about yarding next. In Eagle, there were 721 acres of helicopter yarding. Now, helicopter yarding is when there's no roads into the area. They just fell the trees and then haul them out by helicopter. It's more expensive, doesn't have as many impacts on the ground. 260 acres of skyline yarding and 49 of tractor. Compared to Jazz, 979 skyline yarding and 220 acres of tractor yarding. Hold that in your minds, we'll get to it. With Eagle, it was going to build 1.2 miles of new road. Hadn't been long before, 1.2 miles of new road, pretty bad. However, Jazz has been long before. There are 11 miles of roads in Jazz that were actively decommissioned. Money went in, time went in, taking them off the landscape. They're rebuilding those roads. And they're both adjacent to wildernesses. So if you look at these in comparison, the Jazz Timber Sale actually has many more environmental impacts, but there's a big difference. What's the big difference that made it easier for us to fight Eagle? Old growth. Average tree height. Old trees versus small trees. 
There's something about old trees that just like breaks your heart, just like boom, you know? It's just like triggering. People see a big old tree, they're like, protection! I want to hug you and love you and live in you. People see a small tree, they're like, oh, this was a plantation, it's coming back. Not that much ecosystem value. Win-win solution. Like really, there is a different visceral reaction to old trees versus young trees. Which is interesting because in terms of ecosystem health and forest function, the difference isn't that great. But in terms of the way we perceive the sales and the way we perceive the forest, the difference is vast. Another thing to hold in mind. But what we're really going to focus on is the industrial extraction because it's at least as bad to log the small trees, if not worse, because you have to log over a wider area to get the same amount of volume from smaller trees. And as you can see, they're getting over at least two times as much volume out of these small trees as they were in Eagle because they're casting a very wide net. And so the industrial infrastructure needed is huge. So first of all, machine logging. All right, this is a big one. A lot of people still have in their minds, logging is like a guy with a chainsaw, you know, walking out into the forest with his chainsaw, cutting down the trees. The only impact to the ground is his boot tread. Not so much, not so much anymore. So this is a feller buncher. It cuts down trees, picks them up, limbs them, throws them in the back. It's heavy. They machine log in the winter, often. This picture was taken in February of this year. This isn't a yarding impact, it's not a tractor. That's after machine logging came through. That's the Annie's Cabin timber sale in BLM land. Again, <laughs> touted as a restoration thin. But the impacts to soil from compaction and rutting are massive. So there's machine logging, and that's just to take the trees down. The next question is, once the tree is taken down, how does it move from its place in the forest to an access point where the company can haul it away? That's called yarding. Remember in the specs I talked about the Skyline yarding, helicopter logging, and tractor yarding. Tractor yarding is literally pushing trees or pulling trees with a tractor through the forest. Again, tractors are heavy. They're heavy. They compact the soil. And one of the things about jazz, it was already clear cut. And so there's lasting legacy impacts on the soil. A lot of it is already compacted. It was cut 40 to 60 years ago, and the soil is still compacted, noticeably. It's not growing back. And so they're going back in and tractor yarding again in these already compacted soils. And remember when I was talking about the earth flows? Earth flows don't like compaction. It means they can't absorb water very well. It creates a lot of surface runoff. And so there's regulations in the resource management plan for Mount Hood that says if you have an earth flow, you can't have more than 8%, or you, you shouldn't, it's an important word here, you shouldn't have more than 8% compaction in an earth flow area. And you shouldn't tractor log on it. There's not very many good things in the Mount Hood forest management plan, barely any really, but those ones are there. You shouldn't have more than 8% compaction and you shouldn't tractor log. So the Forest Service, in its environmental assessment, decided to exempt itself from the standards. And it said, it says should not shall. And so we can exempt ourselves and we're going to. So you have tractor logging on over 400 acres of unstable, overcompacted slopes in the Kalawash River, which is a drinking watershed. All of this, if you're thinking, all of this leads to landslides, you're right. So there's ground-based tractor yarding, and then there's skyline yarding. Skyline yarding usually happens on um, steep slopes because they're too steep for a tractor. So what they do is uh, cut a corridor. And typically I've seen the Forest Service, or now it's the private companies who are going to log who mark the trees. So the companies mark their corridors for the most beautiful, oldest trees in the area that they wouldn't be able to log under the prescription of the sale, but they are able to log if they're incidentally taken. So if you have a remnant or a legacy tree, you're not able to log it if this is a commercial thin, 
But if there's something incidental like a skid road or a skyline corridor or a temporary road, they're often placed specifically where the older trees are because they're incidental so they can be taken. So skyline yarding corridors are little thin strips, 15 feet wide strips going down hills of clear cut. There's 979 acres of skyline in Jazz and the Jazz EA itself says that there's five Jazz units totaling about 60 acres of quote, skyline yarding on steep slopes with highly erosive soils that have potential to become chronic sources of erosion and sediment. Yet they conclude that there's no impact on soils or water from this sale. Logical inconsistencies abound with the Forest Service. So just the act of moving the logs from where they're cut to where they're going to be hauled has incredible detrimental impacts. And it's something that's not often talked about in commercial thins. People only talk about density. And it's true, some of these stands are overstocked. It's true they would also naturally self-select. But even if logging them was the right thing to do to grow trees bigger, faster, the removal of them has huge and long-lasting impacts on the watershed which are not being taken into account in the Forest Service or even other environmental groups' rhetoric. So that's yarding. Now there's landings. Landings are the places where they stack all the logs up and wait for them to put in the truck. You can imagine there's an incredibly high amount of compaction here. Landings never revegetate. They're like roads. Unless they are totally ripped, subsoil ripped, and replanted, and even then you can go back 40 or 50 years later and you can tell where the landing has been. So in the total of landings, roads, yarding corridors, like I said, it's 111 acres of clear cuts throughout the Jazzway. And remember, this whole project is touted as restoration. I'm just gonna drop that in a couple times so you can get your mind around the Forest Service rhetoric versus what actually happens on the ground. So there's landings. Now we're gonna talk about roads. And as I mentioned before, the Kalawash already has five miles of road per square mile. The Mountain Hood National Forest has 4,000 miles of road in it. I once heard something about all the logging roads on national forests in the United States I think could circumnavigate the globe three times. There's a lot of roads in our forest and they are by far the worst thing to do. And leaving them on the landscape is crazy. So the first of all we've got issues with maintaining the roads that do exist. Remember we were talking about earth flows. If you were a road and the land beneath you started moving, what would you do? Here is a road that the land above it, this was happened last year, it's the 6330, and um, the land above it just gave way. Whoosh, and collapsed into the road, because any road inherently unstabilizes the slope that it's cut through. I mean, you can think about it, if water flows down hills or over land, and then water is flowing, and, and your land is flowing in all these earth flows, and then the road cuts through that flow, everything's disrupted. So you have issues like landslides, which are very common. There were seven landslides in the Kalawash watershed last year. Some, their terminus was the river itself, which is no good. Or this side of the road could fall down. This road was worked on and repaved the year before this landslide happened. The road just gave way. The earth underneath it wanted to move. It happens in earth flows. Or you could be like this road, that uh, wasn't quite so dramatic, but it just decided to buckle and move a bit. All of these things happen to the roads in the Kalawash River watershed. And the Forest Service doesn't have a budget to maintain the roads. So BARC has been working very, very hard to get the Forest Service to remove roads from the landscape. It's really the only thing we can see as true restoration in this area, except for maybe culvert work, is just to get rid of the roads because they are chronic sources of sediment and disruption in the watershed. And so we secured funding for the Forest Service through Congress to remove the roads. And they created a plan where they said they were going to remove 51% of their roads, which for National Forest was the most progressive and awesome act that any National Forest had yet taken. The most vigorous commitment to road removal. Bark was psyched. They decided to do it in five increments in different places throughout the watershed. Increment two 
is the Kalawash River watershed. And they came out with a really great environmental assessment that would have decommissioned 255 miles of roads. That was their preferred alternative. And we're like, yay, that's awesome. 255 miles of road decommissioned, taken off the landscape. That's great. And usually the Forest Service moves and does its preferred <coughs> alternative. Like no matter what we say, and we're always saying, no, no, do more, do more. They're like, no, we're doing the preferred alternative. <laughs> However, in this case, there were countervailing interests from the hunting lobby and from the Forest Service's own timber shop. And they said, that is too many roads. We want to have access to more forest to hunt and log. And so the Forest Service said, okay. And um, their decision was to decommission 170 miles of roads. So when we got the decision and then we compared it to the Jazz timber sale, it became very clear that many of those roads, almost the majority of those roads, were still kept on the landscape to allow for the logging, the restoration logging, of the jazz sale. So that's one thing, it prevented them from decommissioning. And one of those roads was the 6330, the one that had a huge landslide the next year. So it kept them from decommissioning, which is pretty bad. But the part that kind of gets our ire up almost more than anything is the fact that they are recommissioning roads that they have already decommissioned. Costs like, I don't know, between five and, I've heard between five and $50,000 per mile of road decommissioned. I think it really depends on the road. That's a big span. Cost a lot though to decommission roads. And it takes a lot of time for that road decommissioning to really take effect. And it could be as easy as doing a berm like this and then just replanting the road. Or it could be an old road like this where it recontoured and it's actually naturally restoring itself. There's other roads that are still considered system roads outside of this 11 miles that haven't been used for so long because they've been gated, that trees started growing up in the middle of the roads. They've just naturally started to decommission themselves. We went out to Jazz two weeks ago. The decision on this still isn't out, by the way. We went out two weeks ago and the roads have been logged. They've started cutting down the trees that are naturally regrowing in the roads to facilitate for logging, setting back the restoration of the roads 20 years. And so, and those are the ones that had just naturally decommissioned themselves, not the ones that the Forest Service had put time, money, and effort into decommissioning. But there's 11 miles that are off the maps that are going to be put back on the maps. Questions at the end. So we've got the recommissioned roads. Boo. We don't like those at all. And there's, like, the last thing I'll say about that is the Forest Service says, don't worry. We're going to decommission these again afterwards. But there's two things about that. First of all, the Forest Service is supposed to be um, releasing increment four, which is the next increment of road decommissioning in the Oak Grove watershed. And about a month ago, they said, we're not doing it anymore. We're done decommissioning roads. We don't have funding. So there's that. So listening to them say they're going to decommission anything especially in this situation where we might have 40 to 50 years of recovery lost and then re-decommissioning the road after rebuilding the road to allow for restoration of the forest might not actually ever happen. That's not a guarantee. There's every likelihood that they're going to say, sorry, we ran out of money. We're not going to re-decommission the roads. And so we might have those 11 miles of road permanently left back on the landscape and not being maintained in a bad condition. So that's another issue that's difficult. Last thing about roads is they get used. So Jazz has over 80 miles of haul route that turns roads basically into streams full of sediment as they go. On rain events, roads just move the dirt into the creeks. They just move it. And the more hauling there is, the more loose soil and sediment is ground up and log trucks again are heavy and they have a heavy toll on roads and then when the rains come you can see right here there's a little sideboard ditch that's just channeling all of that murky goo directly into the creek which flows into the Kalawash which is one of our last hopes for wild coho 
So 80 miles of hauling doesn't seem like a very good idea. You ask, but doesn't the Forest Service administer these sales? Don't they make sure that these impacts don't happen? The answer typically is no. I'm sorry if this is a downer, but it's true. So, oh, before I get into how they don't administer, I want to show just one more thing. I want to show you what a restored forest looks like. There it is. It's restored. That was logged about two years ago with a similar prescription to the jazz sale. And um, you might notice there's still some trees there. But what's missing? Anybody? Old growth. Old growth is, that's already missing. What's missing that might have been there before? Story. Understory. Everything, everything, everything else, pretty much. These commercial thins basically destroy the entire understory. But not to worry, they grow back with, can anyone ID that plant for me? It's growing in abundance in a recently thinned area. Bull thistle, bull thistle. Just what we want regrowing in the understory of our restored forests. Because when you open up the canopy, bring in the, all these machines, all these logging trucks, they carry seeds of invasive plants. So now we're getting bull thistle, scotch broom, blackberry, all moving into these wide open understories and then out competing a lot of the natives that should be and you know potentially will be growing back but in the interim all of the understory habitat is completely lost and those areas are desiccated we've been doing a lot of monitoring in post logged areas recently and they are dry and barren just like you shouldn't feel in a west side forest so these are some of the impacts of commercial thins that aren't talked about when you just talk about removing density. Going to take questions at the end? I'm on a flow. Almost there. No? Wait. All right. There's a few more things I'm going to say. The first is there's more than just the environmental impacts that are difficult. Do you remember how big jazz was? 2,000 acres. 2,000 acres. How is anybody going to track what happens on 2,000 acres? Do you think the Forest Service has enough staff to oversee the logging on 2,000 acres? The Clackamas River Ranger District has one timber sale administrator. We asked him what sales are being actively logged right now. He says, well, I don't track that. You know, he doesn't even, he, he's not even tracking what's actively logged, which means the only people tracking it are the timber companies that are cutting it. And their objectives are slightly different than the ecological restoration that the Forest Service would like us to believe is happening. If no one's out there watching, who's to know what's going to happen on the ground? And one of the few groups who knows, maybe, a little bit, is Bark. We had 138 people, spent 600 hours field checking jazz, visited 80 units, Recorded a lot, and we picked a lot of mushrooms. That's one of the best things about being a bark volunteer in the fall. You get to go pick mushrooms. There's Mark. He's got a lot of chanterelles. He leads a really kick-in mushroom hike in October, by the way. But um, there's a lot of awesome things in jazz. There's not going to be chanterelles growing there after the canopy is gone, by the way. But bark is out there checking things out, and it's really, really hard to cover 2,000 acres. And that's not the only project we're working on. And we're not the only stakeholder on Mount Hood. You know, we're uniquely situated to get people out in the forest, but it's almost impossible to keep track of what the Forest Service is doing. They're planning timber sales that are just too big. Like, simply too big for anyone to track. So one of the things from a public policy perspective is we're asking them is to tone it down. Plan sales that people public people and Forest Service people can actually track, know what's on the ground, know what the logging looks like, because we can't monitor every move that's happening as much as we'd like to. So we find things like this. Leaf trees are marked red. And this is the swag timber sale. We found four leaf trees marked red. They were left. I'm surprised they were left because another thing timber companies are supposed to do is mark the base of the tree, right? So you know that the leaf tree, if it's logged, was a leaf tree because it's got a base on the stump. Not a single stump in this entire timber sale was marked. 
So you don't know if the tree that was taken was supposed to be taken or not. They were courteous enough to let us know that four trees were illegally logged and left. But that, the Forest Service had no recollection of that, no knowledge because they're not monitoring any of this. So Bark's doing some extensive post-sale monitoring. It's really fun if you want to do it. Mayor will talk about how to get involved after that. But there's just very little accountability. And the main thing to know from this is that no matter what the Forest Service says, and no matter what their rhetoric is, at the end of the day, the timber shop still rules the roost. This isn't restoration. You know, this is logging, this is commercial logging for a commercial product. Because true restoration would be decoupled from commercial logging and not have the residual impacts. So, what do we want the Forest Service to do? This is a jazz unit. One of my favorite quotes in the entire jazz environmental assessment said this, with no action, at 200 years of age, these stands would function in a similar fashion to a treated stand, but may have larger amount of snags and downwood debris. They're saying, if they didn't act now, the forest would recover itself better, which we know, and which we're also saying. So the only real justification for the sale is to extract a commercial product from the forest. So what do we do about it? We organize, we fight, we take the cool bus out to the forest. We let people know that commercial thinning for restoration is bullshit. Like, really seriously. And if you talk to another environmentalist who says that it's a win-win solution, please ask them about the collateral damage, the residual impacts of what it takes to move those trees, which should be left on the landscape to become habitat, off to the mill. Because at the end of the day, that's the only point, is to get trees off of our public lands for private profit for the timber industry. It's a lot harder to fight than eagle. People don't give a big shit about little trees. They just don't. But I'm hoping you will. And talk to other people about them. Because what we're seeing now, post eagle, are plantation thins. And they still have an impact. These forests have been devastated and are just, just on the cusp of starting to recover. And my dearest hope is that we let them, and that we let them.